Part 1 You will hear a woman, called Tanya, talking to her friend, called Simon, who lives abroad. Tanya is planning to visit Simon. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello? Hi, is that Tanya? Yes, Simon. Lovely to hear you. How are you? Very well, and we're so looking forward to seeing you. So am I. Now, I don't have a lot of time, I'm afraid, so I wanted to make sure we've got all your details. Have you confirmed your flights? Yes, I'm definitely coming on the 22nd of June. Excellent. Have you got your flight number? Not with me, I'm afraid, but I promise I'll email it. Let me make a note of all this. Yes, do, because one of us will try to come and collect you from the airport, if we can. I presume you'll be coming into Terminal 1? Uh, I don't know. I'll have to find out which one it is. Yes, you must. <laughs> we don't want to be waiting at the wrong one. But hang on. I'll be arriving at about lunchtime, and that'll mean you have to take time off work to pick me up. You really mustn't do that. Look, we're not all that busy at work, and if there's a problem, I can text you when you arrive, and you can take a taxi. Okay. There's a really good company called Pantera. Can you spell that? It's P-A-N-T-E-R-A. -E they have a stand at the airport. You can't miss it, and they're really reliable. Great, thanks. How far are you from the airport? About 40 minutes. And you're near the city centre, aren't you? We're east of it, actually. Uh, don't tell the driver city centre because you'll really get caught up in traffic. OK. And I'll make sure I carry your address with me. Now, have you got my mobile, a uh, cell phone number? Yes, you sent it last month. But I tell you what, I don't think I've got yours. I'd better have it now, just in case. OK, and I changed it recently anyway. Ready? It's 07765-328-4000. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Now, what should I pack? Well, all the usual. Casual clothes, mainly. Though you'd better bring an evening dress. We'll be having at least one fancy dinner in a hotel restaurant. OK, now, when you're coming, unfortunately, the weather is not going to be brilliant. I know. It's the rainy season. I'm bringing an umbrella. Uh, we have tons of those, so don't pack one. But pack a raincoat, a good one, because we'll try and get out for plenty of hikes. OK, sure. Sounds super. Just what I love. And I'd better remember to pack my sturdy walking shoes. Excellent idea. It's pretty rugged round here, so they have to be tough. I can imagine. I'm so looking forward to getting out. Oh, Simon, 
before I forget, you recommended I read a book about your area. Yeah. What was the name again? I'd like to read it to get an idea of the history, etc. It's called Mountain Lives, and it's. Hang on, I'm just writing it down. Okay. And it's by Rex Campbell. Great. I'll try and get hold of that. Well worth it. Now the really important things are gifts. Oh, don't worry about that. Just bring yourself. I know, <laughs> but I'd like to get something for your parents. What about Janice? I know she loves English tea. Oh, that's very kind, but she's not drinking so much of that these days. But she'd love some chocolate. You know her favorite. Oh yes, that'd be nice. I'll do that. And Alec, is he still into racing? <laughs> very much so. I was thinking of bringing a calendar, you know, with horse racing pictures. What a good idea! He'd love that. Great. So that's about it, I think. Yes, I think so. So you'll send me your number again. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a podcast on Camber's theme park. Now you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome to Canvas Park Podcast. In the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little about the park and the amazing things we have to offer. We like to think that Canvas offers more than other theme parks. Like them, we have a variety of exciting rides for people of all ages, but Canvas also places strong emphasis on the educational experience for its visitors. Not boring facts, but lots of interactive exhibits. Although it's mainly an outdoor experience, we do have some indoor activities if the weather gets too dreadful. The park's got a lovely, well-established feel. Set in 80 acres of beautiful countryside, about three miles south of the tourist resort of Dulchester. The park was set up in 1997 by the Camber family, but then taken over by new owners in 2004, who have maintained the original vision of the Cambers. It has lots of old trees, hundreds of flower beds, and a gorgeous lake. Cambers has over 45 different rides, exhibits and arcades. All but one of these is free once you've paid your entrance fee. We charge a small fee for our newest ride to reduce the length of the queues. You don't pay anything for parking. A family ticket for a family of four works out at about £8 per person, which is amazing value. Full details of current prices are shown on our website, along with full details of rides, etc., and directions for getting to us. 
We also have a number of special offers. For example, if you live locally, why not join our Adventurers Club, which entitles you to 50% off ticket prices all year round and a special lane for all rides and exhibits, which means you don't have to wait to get into any part of the park. See the Offers tab on the website. We've recently added a number of new exhibits to the park and we're particularly proud of our Future Farm Zone, which houses over 20 different species of animals, from chipmunks to dairy cows. The emphasis is on getting near to the animals. All of them can be petted and you can buy food for feeding the animals. Many of our younger visitors say that this is the high point of their visit. And speaking of food, don't let the animals have all the fun. We have a total of seven different catering outlets on the site. We're open 10 to 5.30 all year round and cold drinks and snacks can be bought at any time during opening hours. And hot food is available most of the day in the Hungry Horse Cafe from 11 until 5, just half an hour before closing time. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now we want all our visitors to have an exciting time when they come to the park, but our first priority must be safety. Parents and guardians know their children's behaviour and capabilities, but here at the park we have set certain conditions for each of the rides to ensure that all visitors get the maximum enjoyment out of the experience and feel secure at all times. There are four major rides at the park. Our newest ride is the River Adventure, which is designed to reproduce the experience of white water rafting. No amount of protective clothing would make any difference, so only go on this ride if you're prepared to get wet. Children under eight can go on this ride, but all under 16s must have an adult with them. Not all of our rides are designed for thrills and spills. Our Jungle Gym roller coaster is a gentler version of the classic Loop the Loop, specially created for whole family enjoyment, from the smallest children to elderly grandparents, suitable for all levels of disability and health conditions. Carriages have comfortable seating for up to eight people with safety belts for each passenger, which must be worn at all times. Sit back and enjoy the scenery. One of the best established and most popular of Camber's rides is the massive swoop slide. Whiz down the polished vertical slide nine metres in height and scream to your heart's content. There are no age or height restrictions. Be careful, though. You must have on long trousers so you won't get any speed burns. And then there's the famous Zip Go-Kart Stadium with 16 carts, eight for single drivers and eight for kids preferring to ride along with mum, dad or carer. Take part in high-speed races in our specially designed Formula One style carts but no bumping other carts, please. All riders must be above 1.2 metres because they have to be able to reach the pedals, even in the shared carts. Full details of all safety features are available on our website at www.cambaspark.com. So come and make a day of it at Camber's Theme Park. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two.
Part 3 You will hear two geography students, Jack and Katie, talking about a field trip to Kenya in Africa. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Katie, hi. Thanks for inviting me round. Oh, thanks for coming. I know you're up to your neck in finals revision, but I've got to make up my mind about next year's geography field trip, and I'd really like your advice. We've got to choose between an African trip and one in Europe. They've told us a bit about both trips in the lecture, but I really can't make up my mind, and I know you did the African one last year. That's right. So, where exactly did you go? I mean, I know it was in Kenya, in East Africa. Yes. Well, we were right up in the northwest of the country. It was beautiful. We stayed in a place called the Marich Pass Field Studies Centre. Right. Dr. Rowe said the accommodation was traditional African-style cottages. Uh, he had a special name for them. Bandas. Yes, they're fine. You have to share two or three people together. They're pretty basic, but you have a mosquito net. They don't provide spray, though, so remember to take plenty with you. You'll need it. <laughs> and there's no electricity in the field centre. You'll have hurricane lamps instead. They give a good light. It's no problem. What about places to study? Dr Rowe said there was a library? Yes, but it's quite small. There's a lecture room as well, but most of us worked out in the open air. There are plenty of places outside, and it's so beautiful. You're right in the middle of the forest clearing. I gather it's a relatively unmodernised area. Definitely. They actually set up the centre there because it's on the boundaries of two distinct ecological zones. The mountains, where the people are mainly agriculturalists, and the semi-arid plains lower down, where they're semi-nomadic pastoralists. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So how much chance did you get to meet the local people there? Did you get the chance to do interviews? Yes, though we had to use local interpreters, but that was OK. Then we did field observation, of course, looking at environmental and cultural conditions and morphological mapping. What's that? Oh, looking at the surface forms of the landscape, the slope elements and so on. What about specific projects? Yes. After the first two or three days, we spent most of our time on those. We could pretty well do what we wanted, although they all had to relate to issues concerned with development in some way. People did various things. Some were based on social and cultural topics, like the effect of education on the aspirations of young people. And some did more physical process-based studies, looking at things like soil erosion. My group actually looked at issues relating to water, things like sources such as rivers and wells and quality and so on. It was a good project to work on, but a bit frustrating. We felt we needed a lot more time, really. Right. Dr Rowe did say something about limiting project scope. Yes, he told us that too at the beginning, and I can see why now. What else? Well, we had some good trips out as part of the course. We went to a market town, a place called Sigur, that was to study distribution. And to look at agricultural production, we went to the Weiwei Valley. That's an important agricultural region. 
And what about animals? Did you have a chance to go to a national park? Sure. We did a trip on the last day, on the way back to the airport at Nairobi. But actually, there was lots of wildlife at the field centre. Vervet monkeys and baboons and lizards.、Mm, it does sound good. It was excellent, I'd say. In terms of logistics, it was very well run, but it was more than that. I mean, it's not the sort of place I'd ever have got to on my own, and it was a real eye opener. It got me really interested in development issues and the way other people live. I did find it frustrating at the time that we couldn't get as far as we wanted on the project. But actually, I'm going to follow it up in my dissertation, so it's given me some ideas and data for that as well. So you'd say it was worth the extra money? Definitely. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear a presentation by a student about a website she has designed for a supermarket. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully, and answer questions thirty-one to forty. For my website design project, I decided to approach Super Save Supermarkets because I have an evening job at the supermarket, so I already have a slight insight into their organisational goals and workings. The field research for my project was in two stages. First, I had an interview with Mr. Dunn. Who is in charge of Super Save's customer care department? I discussed the project with him in order to identify the supermarket's requirements. Mr. Dunn said customers are often unwilling to make a face-to-face -face complaint when they've experienced difficulties with a product or a member of staff or anything related to the supermarket. So he said a website which allowed members of the public to get in touch with the organisation and bring the problem to their attention in a private manner might be very useful, and we agreed that I'd work on this. For the second stage of my research, I devised a questionnaire to put to SuperSave customers. I needed to find out about the customers' experiences of problems, together with their attitudes towards making complaints. Both directly and indirectly, I used a mixture of closed questions such as "Have you ever experienced a problem at any SuperSave store?" and open questions such as "What would you find helpful about a customer complaint website?" I decided to do interviews rather than rely on distribution of the questionnaire, as I felt this was likely to lead to a higher take-up rate. I visited four SuperSave stores. Two in the city centre and two in the outskirts, and altogether I interviewed 101 respondents. Then finally, I analysed the results. I found the results of the questionnaires to be very informative. I found that out of the total number of customers investigated, 64% had at some stage encountered a problem in a SuperSave store. Out of these people, the vast majority, 
said that they hadn't reported the problem to any member of staff. They just kept it to themselves. The next thing I tried to find out was why they hadn't complained. Well, about twenty-five percent of the people I interviewed said the reason was that they couldn't be bothered, and a slightly smaller percentage said that they didn't have enough time. But fifty-five percent said the reason was that they felt intimidated. I finally asked if they would be more likely to complain if they didn't have to do it face to face, and nearly everyone I asked said that they would. Ninety-five percent, to be exact. I then set about designing the website to meet these needs. Once I'd completed the website, I made another appointment with Mr. Dunn to find out what he thought of it. Mr. Dunn said he felt that the pages would benefit his organisation by giving customers a new way of expressing their complaints and by making it easier to collect complaints. Identify specific places where service and customer care were not as good as they should be, and act upon them accordingly. Supersave is already a highly customer-oriented organisation, and he thought our website would be an excellent addition to their customer care effort. This is all well and good, but there still remains the general problem with websites that there's a lack of access to online computers. Surprisingly, in my survey, I found that eighty-eight percent of those interviewed had access to the internet, which I felt was quite high. But this access wasn't always direct. For some people, it was through their children and grandchildren and neighbours and so on, rather than being readily available in their own homes. This could prove to be a major drawback to the site. But it is still better to have it now to get the edge over competitors, however slight. And in the very near future, it is expected that almost everyone will have direct access to the internet. Another thing to consider is that at the moment, I can only base our conclusions on data gathered from a tiny fraction of the supermarket's customer base. In order to get a better idea of how the site is doing and to see how well I have met my objectives, the site will need to have been up and running for at least a few months. After this time, it'll be possible to see whether or not people are actually using the site, and if it's helping to make improvements to their customer service. It would also be interesting to study the effect of the site on staff at the supermarket. Morale could be dented as more complaints come in. Staff may feel they are being unfairly criticised, and that there is no need for another way for customers to complain. But also, the site could boost morale by making staff come together to overcome the constructive criticism, and they may gain more job satisfaction by knowing that they are making a difference to the customer. So, overall, I feel my website has met my objectives, but there is scope for improvement and expansion. Are there any questions? That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.